It's a little shocking to hear Jesus say that whoever loves father or mother, son or daughter more than they love Jesus is not worthy of him. I mean, it's right there in the Ten Commandments. Honor thy father and mother. Yet Jesus is asking us to put them, parents, in line behind him. Instead of getting home before curfew, we are asked to take up our cross and follow him. He leads us away from the familiar. He asks us to lose our lives in order that we may find them. He asks us to shed some of our trappings, to move them down in our top 10 list and to move him up. Jesus asks us to deny ourselves and follow him. Follow him bearing a cross like his. In common parlance, we use this phrase to describe a burden. That's his cross to bear, we say, when someone has been badly injured or is saddled with a mountainous debt of a profligate child. Jesus does not think of the cross, your cross, as a burden. The cross that trails behind Jesus signifies that he denied himself to serve God. The disciples, we, are asked to do the same thing, to deny ourselves, not negate ourselves, obliterate ourselves, but deny. Perhaps we don't cease doing anything that now defines our lives. Jesus does not say there will be no more fishing, no more games, no more laughter or love. Taking up our cross denying ourselves and following Jesus. These are not an invitation to living like John the Baptist, wearing animal skins and foraging for food. In denying ourselves, life will go on. Real life, a life more real than it was before. Our lives and what we define them by is not a foredrawn conclusion. It is for us to choose will, what we will define ourselves by. The life we have fashioned, our achievements, our accomplishments, our skills, the tale of where we've been and who we know. Or will we have that exact same history and yet define ourselves as a disciple of Christ? Will we take on the identity of the cross or will we find that carrying the cross leaves us too little space for stuff of our own? This is key. Do we have room for the stuff Jesus wants us to have room for or not? I've been thinking about this and the work we need to do toward racial justice and promoting human dignity. I know we are, for the most part, flummoxed. Much of what we ponder involves giving things, money, education, housing. All of that is needed, but it's not ours to give. It was theirs, is theirs, and has been kept from them. Churches have for years had sister churches, choir exchanges, mission trips, all in predominantly black areas so that we might, um, we might mingle and learn something. We now know that that isn't enough. We know those well-meaning things are a little like tourism. We accept food that is offered, sing music that feels strange, we sit through a two-hour worship service, occasionally being jarred by an outburst from the congregation. We come home with the aura of the new and different still around us, but it is an aura around us, not within us. I was thinking about this with black people. 
thinking about how much what I thought was universal turns out to be merely white. I've been thinking about how little I understand the meaning of things because I am looking at them through the eyes of my life that I hold on to so tightly. I've been aware of the thoughts that fly through my head and have tried to really hear them, tried to re realize their implications. So, for example, when they were having George Floyd's funeral, the big public one that Reverend Sharpton preached at, there was this huge colorful representation of George at the front of the room. It might have been a projection or a painting. I learned later that it was a copy of the uh, sidewalk art. See, I don't even know how to refer to it. It was a copy of what was painted where he spent his last eight minutes and 46 seconds of life. To me, it looked like graffiti. Beautifully done graffiti, but something done with chalk, loud, bright colors. Because I know I'm not supposed to think this. I didn't think, wow, how strange for a funeral. I didn't think, it looks so undignified. I didn't expect a tasteful framed photo of George where there was this mural. I didn't feel a little uncomfortable, almost embarrassed for this simple and colorful drawing. Except I did feel all those things. Except I realized I saw graffiti where there was art. I saw graffiti and judged it simply because of where and how it was put together. Just the word graffiti, when it's in my head, is not a compliment. The fleeting thought that this was not a real funeral went through my head. I still don't know exactly how to interpret it, but I do know how my own life tightly held on to, blinded me to what I suspect was grief and love and honor and anger and heaven and so much more than my snap judgment. So much more than what I put on it from the vocabulary of my tightly held life. Jesus says those who find their lives will lose them and those who lose their lives for his sake will find them. This is part of what he meant, that when I'm holding on to my life, my identity, my place in the world, my comfort, when I'm holding on to that so tightly, there's no room for information, for learning, for engagement. There's only room for observation, for conscious or subconscious judgment, for my putting my interpretation onto what others do. But when I let go of that life, when I stand in and with Jesus, there is openness. There is room for something new to enter. There is not exchange, but accepting, learning, seeing the particular with eyes and hearts that are universal. Deny ourselves and taking up our cross gives us Jesus' perspective, not ours. And it isn't that Jesus knows all about cultures, although he might. It is about being with Jesus and moving forward, moving towards others. For Jesus, that is what is real. Life is real. Life is joy and grief and sorrow and anger and fear and, 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 and. Real life is the universal expressed in the particular, 
the particulars. If we hang on to our identity as the number one way we see ourselves, if we find ourselves, our life, we've limited it. We know the world. We do not need to ask questions or gather facts. We know we've found our lives. Jesus asks us to shed ourselves, deny ourselves, carry our cross. Those who lose their lives for Jesus' sake will find their lives following Jesus, carrying their cross. Carrying their cross, we will walk toward one another with open hands and eager minds. We may not know or understand all of what we see, but we will see what we're seeing, not what we expect to see. We may not know why certain things are happening, but we know something is happening that doesn't come from our life experience, our limited vocabulary, our history. I'm not suggesting that this is how we stop the systemic racism that is poisoning our world. What I believe Jesus is talking about is gathering the tools we need to begin the work. Losing the life we so tightly hang on to for Jesus' sake. Losing that life can only take us closer to participating authentically in the great task before us.